France is positioning itself, I would argue, as the new Russia. In other words, they are prepared to provide us in return for long-term defense commitments and purchases and technology, because they are prepared to do more co-development and co-production uh, than let's say the Americans are um, in areas like nuclear submarines um, and of course, uh, fighter aircraft, fifth, potentially fifth generation fighter aircraft and so on in a manner I, I would argue no other country so far has indicated. Welcome to the Blue Circle and thank you all for joining in today. Such a big privilege and a pleasure to reconnect with everyone, our distinguished panelists who are handpicked because of the think input they bring in and the rich experience that they bring in. And thank you for also joining us again uh, um, on this panel. Uh, and thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us as well. We've received over 150 registrations, most of whom are CEOs, CXOs and senior leaders in the space. Uh, many of them are our members and repeat visitors to our webinars, which is very encouraging and motivates us to provide higher levels of dialogue through the online channels as well. So for those of you who are new with us today, the Blue Circle is an exclusive community and ecosystem, which is curated for business leaders across four sectors, which are healthcare, e-mobility, energy and real estate. And today we're kickstarting aerospace and defense and further adding logistics to our uh, pool of sectors. Uh, we also present socioeconomic insights, which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market. Uh, in response to the COVID challenge, the Blue Circle has also accentuated its digital presence. One of the many modes we employ is our weekly webinar series and our digital publication on the online front. Uh, in addition to this, and you'll be happy to know that we are very soon launching an exclusive digital platform curated for leaders somewhat like the sectors focused LinkedIn for leaders, wherein we will present them with the opportunity of connecting with people just like them, also house high quality curated content, meaningful conversations like the ones we have and the ones which we'll have today, and business opportunities across sectors will be accessed by these leaders. So those leaders who are interested, please do write to us. We've begun our selective outreach for membership and have close to 3000 leaders who signed up in the last three to four months. And today we're privileged to have these distinguished leaders to join in for our aerospace and defenses uh, uh, circles discussion. They're here to discuss the emerging geopolitical and geo-commercial pressure points in Indo-Pacific region and how these will shape the sector's priorities. And now in the best interest of time, I will just briefly mention the names and designations of the panelists who've joined us. Uh, we have with us Major General Gupta, a combat arms officer, retired as the additional DG weapon and equipment of Indian Army. Presently, he's heading the aerospace and defense practice in Primus Partners. The officer has commanded a counterinsurgency force in JNK and has extensive counterinsurgency and high altitude operational experience in Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh, as well as mechanized operations. And we have with us retired Brigadier Ashish Bhattacharya, served 33 years service in the army, armored corps, comes with rich experience in planning and executing strategic capital procurement cases, with special emphasis on make in India, technology development, equipment manage, management and evaluation trials. Currently working as director policy in Society for Indian Defense Manufacturers and senior advisor in CII. And we have with us Mr. Pravin, Ramit Pal Chaudhary, foreign editor for Hindustan Times. He's also been on the panel previously for our first event in 2017. Uh, welcome back, sir. Uh, a specialist in the analysis of Indian foreign policy and, and, and political economy. Have, having served as a junior, as a senior journalist for over three decades, presently fellow and head of strategic affairs at the Ananta Aspen Center of India, an advisor to two consultancies, Rhodium Group and Bawa Group Asia, member of the Indian government's National Security Advisor Board for four years. And the chair and moderator for the session is Mr. Pavan Chaudhary, who is the best-selling author, CEO and public intellectual and sits on several boards across the country. He's also a trustee with Bhartiya Vidyesh Niti Parishad, a scholar of Rio politics. He has, he has also authored critically acclaimed books on Chanakya and Machiavelli. Welcome, sirs. It's such a big privilege to have you here today. 
and now i request mr choudhary to please chair and moderate the session sir thank you mr choudhary i think uh, we may have lost mr choudhary is just joining back i just got a message from him uh, i think because of the power cuts due to the storm which have come in just a moment please sorry about that yeah i think you were off yeah. so uh, requested of yeah, so the uh, technology um, issue which suddenly came up um, great so machiavelli has said that iron is more important than gold in the context in the context of the contest between nations what he means is weapons are more important than money however today the situation has changed security and economic security both are equally important that means ki tijori bhi bhari honi chahiye aur top bhi bhari honi chahiye if the carbines are full but the coffers are empty you have seen the predicament of russia in the past few decades and if the coffers are full but the carbines are empty you have seen the difficulties which japan has faced in the last few decades so hamare desh ke liye also sone ki chidiya banna hi kafi nahi aane wale time mein hame sone ka baaj banna chahiye क्योंकि चिड़िया को तो नोच नोच के दूसरे पक्षी हजारों साल तक खा गए इस बार सोने का बाज बनेंगे जिससे कोई भी देश हमारी तरफ गलत नजर ना रख सके गिवन दिस बैकड्रॉप दैट इकोनॉमिक्स एंड नेशनल सिक्योरिटी बोथ आर इंपॉर्टेंट आई वुड लाइक टू से दैट both these spaces economic security and national security are changing in the post cold war a new order is emerging which is multipolar but all poles are not equal two of the poles are really big the us and the china pole and the chinese pole is more formidable today than the soviet pole of earlier days because china is strongly integrated into the world economy the us pole is also becoming more and more reliant and part of that has happened because of the shale revolution the shale revolution which has made us self sufficient from the oil and gas perspective is making it not so dependent on having a very strong say or being strongly committed in the middle east the central command which was established to secure its energy lines is today something which is not drawing america's adequate attention so much so that that those countries which were having its protection are turning to their earlier adversary israel for getting that kind of uh, safeguards the ussr and china the russian and china relation chinese relationship has also warmed up where putin is accepting to be the junior partner of china most willingly so much so that he is not only teaching z the art of uh, pancake blinies making but also happy to carry for z a favorite ice cream flavor from russia in an ice box the chinese behavior in south china is china sea is menacing the quad has emerged as a development link cooperative security system 
European powers are waking up to new geopolitics. France has recently committed its support in India, Indo-Pacific. And the Indian and US administration are also clo coming closer than ever before. Nearer home, Indo-China de-escalation and the border has not really happened. South Asian relationships, relationships with countries in our neighborhood are being patched up. With this background, I come to Pramit, Pramit Pal Chaudhary, Mr. Pramit Pal Chaudhary, who is one of the leading commentators of geopolitics and political economy in India, and would I request him to shine some deeper light on this Indo-Pacific and Indian neighborhood space with relation to major powers and the geo-commercial space as well as the geospatial space. Pramitji. Um, thank you, Pavan. Um, let me just uh, try to run through, I think, the present state of Indian foreign policy uh, and the Indian government's assessment of the present geopolitical situation. Um, obviously, China is become and has been anyway for a while our primary security um, come neighborhood concern. Uh, so much so that Pakistan, traditionally our number one concern, has become almost, um, should we say, a tertiary issue, a country that is capable of causing problems for us um, especially on the terrorist front, but a country that's more or less has ceased to become uh, a concern uh, in the larger picture of things, and in many ways has become a subset now of our Chinese policy. As somebody in the Ameri Indian system told me, uh, when we really wanted to, when you really want to handle Pakistan these days, your best your best bet is to phone Beijing uh, and consult with them. Um, and it's notable that Islamabad phones Beijing. Uh, for almost anything regarding India uh, and over in its overall foreign policy. So where does China sit? Uh, Prime Minister Modi, as previous prime ministers have done, has sought to get some sort of an understanding with the Chinese. Not that we would be friends, but at least that we would accept certain core concerns, accept certain red lines between us, um, and therefore at least allow each other not to get into each other's hair beyond a certain point anyway. Uh, Modi definitely Modi Ji tried it. Prime Minister Modi, as you know, has met Xi Jinping uh, 11 times. Um, he's held two informal summits. They met on the sidelines of almost every international summit that India and China have gone. And she has indicated from the start that he wanted to have a different relationship with India, uh, that he was personally invested. However, after Galwan Valley, uh, and that was preceded by Doklam and a number of other uh, border incidents, uh, I think we can safely assume now that whatever China may have felt uh, earlier, uh, it no longer feels a need to come to an understanding with India, um, that at least not an understanding that treats India and China on an equal uh, platform. This substantially changes the way we can operate uh, or cooperate with China. It actually wipes out a lot of the cooperative elements that we were attempting to do earlier. Uh, we have supported Chinese development banks. We have a member of the BRICS. We have a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, but a lot of these obviously don't are, are, will be there, uh, but now will be much reduced in importance because they no longer seem to function uh, as a means to act as a break on Chinese uh, act activity. So what are the results of this? One, we've now come to us believe that the Chinese have, partly because of their own success economically, uh, they are at present very likely or very likely to succeed, uh, uh, overtake America in nominal GDP terms sometime in the next two or three years. Um, of course, China per capita remains extremely much weaker. And in terms of many technological areas, it remains uh, far behind the United States. Uh, but a certain degree of equality has, is, is coming to the fore. China, therefore, doesn't really feel a need to necessarily try to strike a deal with India. As the Chinese like to tell our Chinese officials, tell our officials, 
you must remember that you are one fifth our size. This is a reference obviously to GDP um, and therefore India's place uh, within the international system uh, is therefore defined by this. Um, so what can India do to respond to an obviously much more powerful uh, China? Um, and the way that we are doing so, as you've, one of the ways you're doing so, as you've mentioned, is the Quad, um, which began as a human uh, a humanitarian disaster response uh, organization or to the uh, Asian tsunami crisis uh, and has floated around, drifted if you wish, because the four members didn't agree with each other as to what the purpose of the Quad was. Now we have seen between our, and keep in mind, what has China done? China has hit the Australians with sanctions, economic, massive economic sanctions worth billions of dollars. Um, they have uh, attacked us. Uh, they have increased their, massively increased their pressure on the Japanese and on the Senkaku Islands. And of course their relationship with the United States on a number of fronts has deteriorated, uh, though mainly in the technological uh, area. So we now have an equanimity, an agreement among the four members of the Quad that China has fundamentally changed its posture to all four of us in a negative manner. And this is what is bringing the Quad together. What necessarily the Quad will do after this is still to be determined, uh, but we've seen with the last summit, uh, an agreement on vaccines, an agreement on strategic minerals, an agreement on technology, techno alliances, strategic technologies, um, and so on, all coming uh, climate. In other words, a quad must now be a problem solving organization. We already have, if you wish, a, a, the kernel of a military understanding through the Malabar exercises and some of other related organizations. And we'll see how that develops. Um, so what are we doing in response to handling China? Besides the quad, our, obviously our American relationship now is much more important. It has been important for a very long time. Um, it has been America, and if you look at FDI, remittances, foreign portfolio investment, and so on, put it together, America is overwhelmingly our single largest economic partner. China is our largest trade partner, in which we run a massive deficit with, but it's America that is overwhelmingly um, our, major, our largest economic partner. Um, we have reached out to new countries. Japan has become an extraordinarily important partner in the past 10 years. Um, even the United Arab Emirates uh, has now become at least economically much more important to us. Uh, we have new relationships in Europe that are developing. We'll see what happens with the UK, but with France, we've always had a strong relationship. Um, and of course, there's been a very huge focus on our neighborhood, uh, partly because of Chinese intrusions in that area, but partly because some of them, notably Bangladesh, whose GDP is now larger than Pakistan, and is actually the fastest growing economy in South Asia today, faster than India, um, and well ahead of Pakistan, um, is now become in many ways the most uh, important neighbor, uh, at least friendly neighbor uh, that we have today. There are other elements of that, of what we do overseas, but I think the core of this is what are we looking at since we're talking about defense? Uh, what are our major defense relationships? Um, so Russia has obviously been, as others have many of you have mentioned, that Russia has always been an important uh, and remains in many ways because of legacy issues, our overwhelmingly most important defense supplier. But it's been declining, uh, partly because it's technologically fallen behind uh, a lot of things it does not do uh, very well, like drones, for example. Um, second, it has become extraordinarily dependent on China. Russia is no longer prepared to support any country against China on almost any issue. Uh, and we no longer can depend definitely in, the, in, in diplomacy on Russia to support us against China. They will support us in other areas, but against China, they've been made very clear. We do not, we cannot. China is simply too important for Russia economically and, and politically. Um, Russia remains important and it is prepared to sell us weapons. It is in many ways the only country still one of the few countries that can send us emergency weapons uh, with almost uh, no paperwork uh, whenever we want it. Uh, but it's a declining relationship and it's one that we don't want to break, but we have to manage. And especially on the defense side, because of its dominance there, we are attempting to manage that decline uh, in a manner that doesn't disrupt uh, our overall security. 
America has increased dramatically as a supplier of weapons. We know about the helicopters and potentially later on fighter aircraft and so on. But America, we continue to be a little wary or wary enough that offensive defense platforms, which means fighters, uh, tanks, um, uh, warships, we still remain relatively reluctant to go down the American path. It's partly because the American government has become a little, uh, should we say, unstable. Uh, you saw Obama, isolationism under Obama, isolationism under Trump and other strangeness under Trump. We see Biden being a more normal president, if you wish, but we don't know where America is going to be 10 years, 20 years from down the line. Uh, we assume, we believe, and I think that's probably true to say that they will be hostile to China. Uh, we don't necessarily know how long or how committed they will be uh, to staying in Asia, a continent which they are geographically not a member of. Um, France and Israel are the two other countries that I'll point out. Israel has become an incredibly important niche defense provider. Uh, they have been willing to support us in almost any battle. Uh, we have gotten an emergency issue, Cargill War. They were they came and very helped us out to Galwan Valley. They helped us out, um, but they are limited in what they do. There are areas that Israelis are brilliant in drones, for example, but they do not build fighter aircraft. It's simply too small a country to invest in weapons platforms of that size. But they are very important. And what they do do very well is electronics, uh, missiles, software. And a lot of our Russian equipment uh, is effectively upgraded because Russian electronics isn't so good, uh, upgraded by the use of Israeli, um, <coughs> Israeli bells and whistles uh, on our Sukhois and so on and so forth. And then there's France. France is the most interesting country because while we have bought occasional weapon systems from them, uh, and of course now the Rafale uh, is, is prominent, France is positioning itself, I would argue, as the new Russia. In other words, they are prepared to provide us in return for long-term defense commitments and purchases and technology, because they are prepared to do more co-development and co-production uh, than let's say the Americans are um, in areas like nuclear submarines um, and of course uh, fighter aircraft, fifth potentially fifth generation fighter aircraft and so on in a manner I think I would argue no other country so far has indicated. Um, and we will see where that goes. But France is a strong, very strong defense relationship and I think potentially is arguably among the most significant uh, over the next 10 or 20 years. But we'll see where that goes. And as we mentioned, indigenization is so important. It runs into this big problem that for all of these countries, how much are they prepared to help us build up our own defense capacity and therefore potentially have India develop, become, if you wish, a at least a industrial rival to them in the defense side. Great points. From it, how beautifully you have rounded off the entire piece. What I would just like to throw some light on is first, the quad piece. Uh, history is proof, uh, so far at least, that any major power, European or American power, has not fought a war too much for others, especially for a non white power, allow me to say. So we will need to, of course, depend on all these alliances or informal alliances which are forming, but also at the same time, be and, and self-sufficient uh, to, uh, to handle our own defenses. The second point uh, which you made was also similar. On, on the Russia piece, Russia is not going against China on any important issue. In fact, Russia, which is very technologically advanced on the defense side, is supplying its arms and looking the other way when reverse engineering is happening in China around these arms. Israel, I was reminded of this book, Weapons Wizard, which has come out from Israel. It has a lot, of, uh, a lot of fine nuggets for our policymakers how to indigenize uh, weapon making in India even better. And France, you're right. 
what a good analogy you have drawn that france is trying to be the new russia and one of its warships has already reached the indo pacific and it is exerting its influence and also it has a long history of supporting us starting with 1998 which was a very vocal support against the sanctions which were imposed on us after we exploded the nuclear device for the second time so great points and lastly i would like to say you have said that china is not accepting equality or an overture toward to be an equal and i am really very happy with what our prime minister has done unprecedented uh, outreach towards the defense sector 700% growth in exports between 2016 and 2018 of uh, defense equipment and galloping ahead having said that some statements have to be revised one of those was na aankhein jhuka ke milenge na aankhein dikha ke milenge aankhein mila ke milenge usme bhi we we will need to have the social graces to make sure that too much of a a demand for equality should not bring should not uh, create unnecessary frictions between us and other powers i would also like to say that the last chapter is not yet written by having an uh, a, a strong response with china but not a permanently belligerent response with china we will have the strategic flexibility of uh, having more options to partner with otherwise if we have only one option to partner with sometimes our strategic uh, style these are my uh, preliminary observations great points from it uh, let me come to general rohit general rohit based on what pramit has so beautifully outlined you as uh, an expert in this area and having also headed the uh, weapon and equipment uh, uh, division of indian army as additional dg what is it you would like to say from the military point of view on this geopolitical picture general rohit Uh, thank you pawan ji uh, it was a pleasure to speak to you and certainly a pleasure to speak to mr pramit um, a very exhaustive uh, uh, coverage of the geopolitical situation that was given out um, now what i want to focus on like you have permit me to do as so is the military portion of it which has significance a large part of it uh, country wise has been covered by uh, pramit ji uh, one thing is very clear and it came out extremely clearly in what mr pramit said Uh, that uh, uh, with increasing rise in economic and military capability of china you are finding that america no longer enjoys a primacy in indo pacific please not in the world in indo pacific i shall come to it uh, as to why what do i mean by not uh, not having a military advantage in indo pacific now what has happened to america is that it's had decades of overseas commitments um uh, it's taken a punch uh, on the issue of its economic capability not only this it has also taken a punch in terms of its equipment availability uh you have the uh, budget control act of 211 uh, which uh, basically has reduced uh, tried to rein in the de federal deficit and as a result uh, the real national defense spending has been falling considerably by and it has fallen around 20% uh, with the west 2010 and now it is reaching around uh, 900 uh, billion that uh, it is uh, it is rated at and uh, what does the congressional budget uh, office report says it says that by uh, 2021 end uh, their federal debt debt is going to be 102% of the gdp and by 2051 it is going to double to 202% of the gdp now this is a serious concern which obviously is taxing the americans and therefore its commitments in overseas we are seeing is coming down including afghanistan one of the reasons is this of course the other multitude reasons uh, geopolitical reasons for it one of the issues of equipment fatigue if may say so and that includes manpower fatigue 
it's not only the indian army which is tired which can be considered as a tired army uh, with its uh, deployment in ci ops and as well as on the uh, lc and the lac uh, it is the overseas deployment of the american which is causing it uh, there has been a 52% decrease in the total number of ships from as high as 600 in 1987 to just around 300 today that's a 50% decline at any point of time 100 ships of various kinds are deployed at any point of time that's one third of the commitment of the entire fleet that is there is on active deployment that's a phenomenal amount that is going to be there in gom uh, to neutralize the issue and increase the effectiveness uh, in the indo pacific region he is talking about a us 77 million a uh, dollar worth of uh, of uh, uh, deployment of permanent land based integrated and uh, air air and land uh, missile system it is very important if it has to have a reach uh, towards uh, the island territories of china um now what is china is doing here when you look at china 900% increase between 1996 and 2018 in defense spending now figures are uh, of chinese are not known but it is estimated that in uh, in um, uh, 2019 he had spent 444 billion us dollars and a 6 point or 7 point increase in 2020 is anticipated that means around 500 billion dollars is likely he spent whereas you're looking at america at 900 billion dollars uh, with global commitments china doesn't have global commitments to the degree what us has so that a uh, budget should be seen in that light it's a phenomenal budget with uh, which allows him to do capability building and what has he achieved let's say one significant issue in, uh, besides the cyber behind besides as ai besides space one significant issue which can cause punitive damage is his missile inventory he's got a phenomenal missile inventory of 1500 short range 450 missile uh, medium range and 160 80 meter range this provides him in a very effective capability to have anti access anti denial that's a2 ad as an acronym capability for counter intervention efforts that means can call punitive damage having occupied something he also has the df26 uh, which can which has got enhanced ranges and it can reach as far as the gom area in which us is planning to have its uh, air land missile systems Uh, for a comprehensive attack as well as defense capability it's got the uh, anti ballistic missile df21 d which has got enhanced ranges for the maritime zone very effective missiles against ships and it is considered that and more effectively it's considered that china is much ahead of us in advanced hypersonic missiles this hypersonic missiles are um, uh, are impossible to neutralize as well as they can take on space targets now that is extremely important now these uh, standoff capabilities that it has is enhanced by a large number of fourth generation fighter aircraft advanced c4i uh, sr systems you are all aware of that issue modern attack submarines electronic warfare capability and a whole range of surface to air missiles uh, so with this what happens is that he can provide damage he can cause damage to us expeditionary forces at an enhanced range especially after occupation of island territories and that is what has the implication so what does it mean that uh, uh, that it's all primacy for china no us has dominance in military as far as china is concerned world over the problem is the us now can ill afford to hold extensive bases in the indo pacific because of its economic consideration including equipment and men fatigue if it has to react to any contingency from a stand of area the hawaii or the us west coast he will be found challenged in time and space and possibly preempted by a chinese occupation of any one of the island territories within in its periphery so therefore what will happen is us will have to fight to reach the areas to fight this itself will impose a tremendous amount of casualties with the reach of chinese missile systems given that there is a problem because us considering the amount of attrition that he would take to reach the fight area and the fight itself may well be tempted not to go in for an intervention in asia indo pacific region now this realization is there 
And this realization is what causes the countries to drift towards China, given the fact that it has got economic linkages, it is expanding, it's likely to be the GDP be higher than uh, US anytime. And they say that by, by the end of, uh, of, uh, of another five years to 10 years, it will have a Navy more powerful than the US Navy. So is it all lost? No, it primarily means that if these are the inadequacies of US in the Indo-Pacific region, it needs to be offset by various under con other countries in the periphery and in Indo-US, Indo-Pacific region. This is primarily there so that they can react to a critical flashpoint and allow the US forces to build up. It primarily ensures that the preemptive belligerence would become costly for the Chinese. And if this is costly for the Chinese and the US military forces having build up can cause more amount of damage, the cost of success when colored by the probability of failure is a balancing factor for the internal correction in Chinese belligerent designs. You can't stop its rise but you can have internal corrections in his belligerent designs, and that is vital. Now, for this, what uh, Mr. Pramit said, uh, the Quad, not only the Quad of four countries, the Quad Plus of this region, plus the Quad Plus, plus of the periphery, has taken place in shape of trade and commerce, climate security enablement, in that order. What happens is bring the companies together in an inclusive group of business collaboration. Now, what happens is collective economic interests are built up. And the collective economic interests can be further be augmented by military interchange, including equipment and binding ties. This shapes the fact, all this shapes to the fact that in, in spite of not having a NATO form military pact, countries will have to come to aid of each other and collectively, collaboratively to protect common economic and military interests. This provides an alternative to the countries in ASEAN and uh, RCEP of which China is a part. As an alternative to this, uh, to pull away under the security umbrella and in economic enablement, in economic enablement being first of the Quad, the Quad Plus. So what are the strengths available here in this area? India is the only country in which, in, in the Quad, in which China shares a land boundary. And that is extremely important. If Quad and Quad Plus unifiedly is there in the maritime role along with China, China should consider itself encircled and not vice versa. What is required for the Quad is, the only country in this region which is technologically advanced is US. And for the Quad to function as a cohesive area, enablement of technology is required in terms of compatibility of equipment, joint training, so that the enablement of the plug and play is possible. The Navy has, our Navy has got a joint understanding, which they have come to some sort of an understanding. The Army and Air Force also are not too far behind, but in joint operations, we still not have been able to achieve the kind of interplay of plug and play that is required. The problem is where? We are one country which has got a heterogeneous set of equipment from everywhere, including Russia, Israel, etc. Japan and Australia, by and large, have American equipment. Indonesia also has American equipment. Compatibility of this equipment in terms of logistics, in terms of communication, in terms of interplay, is far better than with Indian equipment. So we have a problem in this issue that uh, we need to overcome. I shall look at this in the next part of the webinar when I will highlight this factor of as to how this compatibility is being built up with the US and how the, tr the uh, trends shall improve the ability to fight as a cohesive cord entity with India also. 
I would like to introduce a concept, and the concept is SINPAN, S-I-N-P-A-N. India has a geographical location central from Africa to America. It has the rising credentials and capabilities in the world. It's time India took a leadership role in this region at, at least. It has to enable the economic progress in this great area, but also form the foremost for the coordination of military efforts as integration and not leave it to USA. USA can be the enabling factor. For this, it is imperative that we set up in India a secretariat of Indo-Pacific nation under the entire umbrella of Quad and Quad Plus in Sinpan to provide an alternative economic as well as military umbrella to China. And that is what will draw out the ASEAN countries from the economic dependence, including Australia, the economic dependence and, and interrelationship with China. It is this which will provide a second uh, tier, an alternative, which shall provide the realization to China and lead to what I alluded to is internal correction in their belligerence and hegemonic design in the Indo-Pacific area. I think that is what is uh, realized by the issue of court. Thank you, Mr. Pavan. Beautiful, beautiful. How beautifully you have added to the dialogue. I am reminded of a cultural view which is represented through an idiom in, in, uh, in Assamese, which means Aage chalne wali gaye ko sher khata hai. The cow which leads the pack is, beaten, is eaten by the lion. On the other side, in Israel, there is a story of a mother who's asked by his, her kid, mother, when will I understand? How will I know that I am dead? She says, when you can't make a fist, you will know that you are dead. And this is the change which is coming in the leadership without going towards too much belligerence. I am happy that courage is coming in the relation uh, in the leadership and your entire proposal which ends is on becoming the leader or the coordinator of defense of Indo-Pacific Indo is what India should do. Beautiful. Now let me come to Pramit and let me ask him to dwell on the few points which you made uh, posed with his points. So one of the points which you said is that we should be uh, not confident, too confident that America will intervene in this space as the leading power because of its reducing budgets, equipment availability, mar maritime deployment, etc. And this goes very well with history. When Churchill wanted America to intervene in World War II, he had to plead for years together and his pleadings didn't work. It was only because an American interest came forward in such a manner that America intervened. So we have to depend on our alliances, of course, but more on our own strength. So given that point, Ramit, and the point that we are not as big as China, we are not as powerful as China, we accept we are not equal to China, but how can we be a big enough nuisance for China? How can we, how can we be that David, which the Goliath is scared of? How can we be sure that the Goliath understands that if I attack this David, I will end up with a bloody nose. I may have a very big sword, but this David, his rusted pen knife, he will place here on the jugular. So I would like you to share how in your understanding we can do this and then close with what are the main theaters of war today, the traditional and the modern, so that I can take 
the discussion to Brigadier Ashish Bhattacharya, who will I will ask to speak about the defense sector, how it is getting ready as a manufacturing and exporting ent entity uh, in this new geopolitical space. Ramit. So yes, I think the key points that you raise are exactly this. What are the interests of the countries involved? Um, you mentioned like the United States has fought incidentally in defense of non-white people. It fought in Vietnam, it fought in Korea, in Asia. Um, it fought against white people in both World War I and World War II. Um, so I don't think the race part doesn't really, in my view, doesn't really factor in very much. The real issue is what is their national interest and is that interest big enough for them to wish to fight on behalf of another country or in defense of another country? Their view, I think, is that, that India itself is a country that has indicated it's not interested in alliances. Uh, you say allies, but the fact is, what is an ally in, in, in the strictest term is that it has a legal, as a legal understanding between two countries, normally in the form of a treaty, that one will come to the defense of another. Um, India has no treaties with any country, though it has a, a, a quasi treaty with Bhutan and not, nobody else. Uh, America does not have a treaty with us. Uh, and keep in mind that in the past, when India and the US have considered that possibility, both sides have said no. Uh, when, in, when after the Chinese carried out a, a nuclear test, their first nuclear test in Lop Nor, uh, India actually went and asked the Americans, would you prepare to extend a nuclear umbrella over India? And the Americans said, no, that's not uh, something we want to do. Uh, and then in 1962, after the Chinese, within uh, the China war, uh, India asked America, would you be prepared to consider a military alliance with us? And the Americans again said no. Um, and I, <clears throat> I would argue now, um, and when the few times America has explored the idea with us, India has also said no. So the assumption in both sides is that there is no question of an alliance. These are two independently minded countries. Uh, what America can do is help India defend itself. And that's ultimately what uh, we want uh, and we would like, and I think America accepts and understands this. And as I said, they've twice rejected in the past the idea of a formal alliance with India. Um, and I think that ultimately the Quad will never be an alliance. I don't think one, three of the members already have an alliance with the United States, our treaty allies. But the question is none of the Quad members are out, if you subtract America, none of the other Quad, three Quad members, Japan, India, and Australia, are allies of each other. We have no mutual defense treaty and we're not even talking about it. Uh, partly because none of us have the capacity. India cannot rush to Japan's aid. It's simply too far away. Japan cannot send their Navy to help us uh, by the time it reaches here, probably be way too late. Um, all we're looking for therefore is each of us to help build up the capacity. And this is what India argues with almost every country that approaches us and says, we would like to build you up, uh, whether as a counter to China or for any other reason. We said, yes, that's what we want you to do. You must invest in India so that India shall become more powerful. And then by, def <clears throat> by just being a more powerful India, we will automatically help your interests. And I would argue that's been something that the American system has largely accepted, at least since the, George, the, the second George Bush administration. Um, and I would argue now that many European, slowly European countries, who are not really focused on Asia, but definitely France is the only one that has an Indian Ocean presence. And Japan has accepted that this is something that is now uh, very much uh, in their interest. They are not a military power per se, constrained by their constitution, uh, but they've invested heavily uh, in our infrastructure uh, and building up India economically as much as possible with the assumption that this will build up our military capacity. Um, when you're talking about the issue of future theaters of war, and that's exactly where we'll be looking at, is that it's not going to be about how many um, necessarily going to be, how many tanks and, and aircraft you can pile up as you did in the past. That's important, uh, particularly as a deterrent uh, to, the other, to another country's use of such weapons. Uh, but in the meantime, I would argue China for all of the superiority that it expresses, is also an extremely cautious power. Chinese statecraft, their own belief in how countries 
defeat each other. The Chinese model or the Chinese ideal, the, the generals that they and the statesmen that they idealize in their history are not ones who actually defeated an enemy in direct battle. They're not, the, they're not General Patton's or von Moltke's and so on. Their generals are the ones who succeed in defeating the enemy without fighting them, by spreading dissension, by turning uh, groups inside, by working out means by which you surround and force the enemy to surrender uh, without putting up any, without putting up any resistance. So the Chinese, this is considered the real ideal of power. Uh, it's not about bludgeoning somebody. It's about persuading the other person that they have no chance of victory and watching them surrender to you accordingly. Uh, so the Chinese game has always been about this. We will support Pakistan to slowly counter India and hold India back. That's not working so well because Pakistan is such a mess. But now they're looking at other places. Let's go to Sri Lanka, let's go to Maldives, let's go elsewhere and see slowly uh, constrain. And then they're sitting there trying to break up the quad, which they've actually succeeded in, in ar ar arresting the development of the quad for almost 10, 15 years. Now their own actions are helping make it accelerate. But where therefore will the Chinese look at? I would argue it's not so much as they're we need to worry too much about uh, the border. Yes, it's, it's there and it's something we need to be prepared for. But I think what Galwan Valley showed to the Chinese is that one of their key problems is they have not fought a land war since 1979. Their soldiers have almost no combat experience. And even in the 1979 war, as you will know, they were, they were bloodied by the Vietnamese. Um, who probably killed as many as 20,000 Chinese in barely three months of combat. Uh, so the, the Chinese are very wary of actually, actually deploying troops and fighting somebody. And Galwan has probably only further uh, enforced the view that when it comes to direct combat, you know, von Clausewitz wrote that it's one general leadership, the number of soldiers you have is important, but the third element of war is the fog of war, just the fact that you don't know what's going to happen. You might, your army might be smaller, but history is filled with armies defeat, small armies defeating larger armies. And the Chinese realize this, that this is this degree of uncertainty is something that nobody can completely ever ensure. You can go into Galwan Valley, you can ambush the Indian soldiers, uh, you can have all the advantages, and yet in the end of it, you probably lost more men. Uh, than the, the, the side you ambush, which clearly indicated once again to the Chinese that this is not the way to go forward. So what are the theaters they'll be looking at? One is that they've developed cyber warfare to an incredible degree, whether they're, whether it's hacking uh, and they perpetually attack. They attack us, they attack the Americans, always looking for weaknesses, testing their systems, seeing how well can we knock out the energy grid, can we knock out the... Uh, one day, I'm sure they're going to go after the Aadhaar system and see if they can knock out the biometric identification system of India for a while. These are things to them, these are the perfect theaters of war to go into. Cyber, space is going to be another one, something that's sort of in, outside the realm of international norms. Uh, they've invested very heavily in space. As you know, they were one of the first, they were probably the first non-Western country to develop an anti-satellite capacity and show that they could do so. Uh, because they know that the American uh, net-centric warfare system is highly dependent on satellites. Um, and these are all areas, thankfully, we are also moving into, but I think we need to invest a lot more. Space, we are actually already quite good on the civilian side. We still need to develop a lot more, I think, especially military recon and space reconnaissance. Uh, we still depend, for example, on the Israelis for a lot of our, uh, for our better imagery. Um, but we have the fourth largest space program in the world uh, and we'll continue to hopefully expand that. Uh, and I think the entry of the private sector into space is very, very important. Uh, people look at America, they look at NASA and say, well, NASA is a feeble uh, agency compared to what it used to be. It's still twice as big as the, the Chinese rivals in terms of money, but that's not the future. The future is that the, the American private sector in space, Elon Musk and so on, is already a $15 billion industry, which is almost 50% larger than the entire Chinese space sector. Um, and it's going much, much faster. So the entry of the Indian private sector to space, I think in September last year, the doors are opened here, an excellent development. 
On the cyber side, we are a software power. We should be a lot better in cyber. But I think we need to have a larger private sector role in that. Indian private sector companies work in Israel to help their defense, cyber defenses. But when you talk to them, they say it's actually very difficult to work with the Indian government. And that's something that has to be changed because our best brains and software and so on ultimately will always gravitate to the private sector. I would also argue we are overemphasized on cyber defense, cyber offensive capacity, preempt the attacks against you, show deterrent um, uh, against uh, potential attackers. These are things we haven't really developed uh, to, to a greater extent. Um, and then finally, I'll just point out as we've all talked about, the unmanned aerial devices, the drones, and now the unmanned submer sub submersibles, that's going to be really the future of a, of a lot of the warfare that we're going to be seeing, partly because no humans are involved. So therefore countries will not see that as a, a, a casus belli, that it's a, a reason for war, but it's the kind of weapon systems that small, targeted attacks that we will see at a sort of below war, below, should we say, normal uh, combat level attacks. And I suspect we're going to may see that on the land border with China in the future. Uh, the drone deployments is going to be an issue there, but we're also going to see that in the Indian Ocean because the Chinese are investing very heavily in swarming, which means that the ability to use hundreds and thousands of drones all at the same time, small ones in the ocean, underwater and in the air. These are technologies that we really need to be moving ahead on. Great, superb points, Pramit. I fully uh, accept your point that it is not uh, a racial preference, but national interest which governments go by. What I meant was that uh, history uh, shows that when a power is becoming less rich and uh, less uh, engaged in defense, uh, it, uh, thinks twice before engaging in uh, action or encounters far away from its shores. Uh, great points. Um, coming to the one point which, uh, which you made, uh, which China is uh, one, of, one, of, one of the Chinese uh, uh, real politic thinker I came across in Singapore and he did say uh, jokingly that uh, Sun Tzu has said that propaganda about the greatness of your war machine is more important than war itself. And the greatest general is one who doesn't win, uh, uh, doesn't engage, but uh, subdues the army just through propaganda. This is something which is uh, very, very strongly lamented by our current generals because they feel that all the world will, will think that we will only do propaganda and no blow. There will be show and no blow. So, but uh, that's on a lighter note. Coming to Brigadier Ashish, and after that, I'll uh, return to Major General um, Rohit. Uh, coming to Brigadier Ashish, uh, Brigadier, 12% of the world imports of arms is accounted for by India. Plus these theaters of war, which Pramit has beautifully outlined, are really buzzing with activity. What has the Indian government done to catalyze defense manufacturing and defense and manufacturing? I also uh, include research, uh, defense manufacturing and defense exports in the last, let us say, five years. Brigadier. We can't hear you. Sorry, Pavanji. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, taking off from your last uh, sentence about how uh, we have changed our tracks over the last five to six years and what uh, uh, Mr. Pramit brought out about technology and, and how it uh, makes uh, or breaks a nation and how uh, win and loss is dependent on that. I would just go back a few, uh, 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 some time back, some time back into space where uh, this is the entire technological base of the world, I think, has started from the armies of the world. The armies competing with each other 
to be one up over its adversaries over time you name a technology and it has emanated from somewhere from the military use of that technology started from there and then it has gone into the civil space india unfortunately uh, or fortunately it was also in this bandwagon for a very long time at as long as it had competing kingdoms working for supremacy over each other but then during the british rule probably we lost that edge and we were doing what the others wanted us to do and that inertia continued for many years now but over the last about a decade or two decades i would say and especially in the last 6 to 7 years uh, we are changing and we are changing for good and we are changing in a big big way so uh, with that as the as the context uh, i would i would uh, list out some of these major areas where the government has done tremendously well in seeing what the problem was and making amends and one of the major areas uh, in this field was the policy front because we had become too process and 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 procedure oriented over these years too scared of uh, going out of our uh, methods in the, in the fear of you know being prosecuted for for uh, uh corruption you name it or or many such factors came in and we were very scared to uh, open up or openly uh, go for uh, you know uh, improvements in our system but then in the last about 5 6 years the government has shown grit and has made major changes dramatic changes to make sure that things happen the way it is happening now and i think uh, it is clear from the fact that the uh, the establishment of the of the dma that is the department of military affairs with the cds heading it and being the central point of advice for the indian government itself is a is a step which has been taken with, whose need was felt for 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 uh, you know many many years but it has finally been done and that uh, i would say uh, in the coming years it will prove itself to be a very very important decision uh the on the policy front or in the policy framework in the last about 6 years we have had two versions of the defense procurement procedures the defense procurement procedure 2016 came out uh which has been uh, been worked on since i think 2013 finally came out in 2016 and uh, thereafter whatever changes uh, whatever was felt uh, has been constantly upgraded till in 2020 we came out with a defense acquisition procedure now defense acquisition procedure it was felt that uh, we had got into a state where we were looking only at procurement and not looking at the life cycle system of management of any weapon system which is important for a country and that is where the thing was renamed as defense acquisition procedure which included the life cycle uh, management of the equipment from womb to tomb as we call it and and everything has been put into place to make sure that it works well if i look at the uh, at, as the dap itself uh, you know we have we've added a number of uh, layers and prioritization of these has been done the categories have increased to 5 and we've got a prioritize which is in favor of indigenization uh we have added something called the by global manufacturer in india which uh is a new thing in dap 2020 and in two, uh, in 2016 we had uh, sorry this uh, by indian iddm was put into place now by indian iddm is indigenously designed developed and manufactured now which means it is giving preference to the indian industry who uses their own design to manufacture goods and that has been placed at the highest priority in case you do not find an equipment which meets the requirement only then you go to the second layer and the second layer is by indian which means an indian do made the design may have come from outside but it is entirely produced in india if you don't find something in that then you go to the third level and that is buy and make indian in which you buy a particular thing as such from a foreign vendor 
and thereafter make it in india with a few items coming uh, from the foreign vendor in the initial stages for you to build the base and then comes by global manufacture in india that means we are now allowing foreign vendors to set up a subsidiary in india and manufacture the entire thing in india for these are for people who do not uh, who have very very high end technologies and are not ready to part with the ip portion of it the, the, the patents for it not ip i would say but they are ready to produce the thing here with help of indian vendors in the whole ecosystem and this i always uh, talk about this as the maruti effect even if it seems to be a little out of tune uh, for indigenization but at the end of the day over a period of time it will bring up the ecosystem of the manufacturing industry in the country by way of outsourcing that these uh, oems do and at the end of the ladder is by global which is you buy something off the shelf one more thing has been added which is called leasing which means in case you have a problem reaching a particular technology level for a particular this thing and you have a level of capability and you require a particular uh, piece of equipment which uh, is required for your operational uh, readiness you could go lease it out for some some time so that uh, till your industry catches up then the government has gone a long way in uh, also uh, looking at uh, you know uh, self dependence through this atmanirbhar bharat atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan and everything in the dap is capturing this in a very big way let us to talk of the august declaration of the negative list we had uh, the government came out with a list of 101 items on the negative list which we call now the positive indigenization list now this is something which not only includes uh, parts of i uh, you know uh, spares components and uh, things like that but it includes major platforms like uh, let us say not non submarine uh, non uh, nuclear submarines ships aircrafts uh, light combat helicopters so all this put together it is it is giving a tremendous boost to the indian uh indian uh, industry ecosystem to make for india and for the indian defense forces to fight with indian equipment in addition to that we have come out they have just come out with a draft defense procurement manual they have come out with a policy on the defense production and uh, export promotion policy which which has led to come of bringing out this fdi policy where 74% of uh, a company would be owned by a foreign uh, this thing for people who would like to bring in high end technology into the country through these alliances or or jvs so this 74% is likely to get in a lot of competitive uh, uh, international uh, players into the game of 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 indian defense uh, business then you talk of tax unification through the gst system or through the incentivization incentivization through the productivity link link uh, you know uh, incentives then the defense offsets policy uh, that itself uh, though it is going at a slow pace but it is picking up slowly in a in a big way and a lot of lot of good technology is coming into the country corporatization of of uh, the the uh, let us say the dpsus or the ordnance factory boards uh, which uh, have archaic procedures procedures which are more on the, aligned to the government method of accounting needs to be uh you know respondent to the market forces and for that corporatization is a very important this thing and the government is thinking on those lines there are study groups there are there are uh, contracts float, floated in which a turnkey uh, advice and turnkey movement is taking place towards corporatizing certain some of these uh, mammoth uh, uh, you know assets that we have uh, with the government which has to become uh, more competitive and uh, and and better uh, in its in its uh, market you know uh, competitiveness uh, then then if if i were to talk of uh, on the on the exports front we have as you are all aware uh, today uh, we have been named as the, we have got a 23rd position in the world ranking of exporters which is which is something which very few people know uh, 
uh, a twenty third position in the world mark uh, world as a world exporter is is and and this come in for the first time in the last about uh, few years. If I look at the uh, overall uh, exports, you won't. Uh, it, it 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 is quite eye opening to say that in two thousand fourteen fifteen. Uh, we had about only 19 uh, 1941 crores worth of exports done in the year of 2018 19 it went up to 10700 crores which is which is fantastic amount of uh, increase uh, from a export authorization given for about 42 items in 1940 uh, uh, sorry 2014 we today have 829 such authorizations given in 2019-20 alone, yes, 2020-21 because of the COVID, COVID the things went down. But in spite of that, there were 633 authorizations given in 2020-21, which is which is something which means the Indian industry today is maturing to world level where it is able to send out so many things out for uh, on exports. The figures that come out of the of the government is that 93%. of exports uh, from the country is going out from indian private industry the remaining coming from the dpsus so it is coming of age not only in technology also in world quality so and all this has been possible because of the uh, because of the policy uh, and and the other environment that has been built around it and if i were to look Uh, the last uh, this thing would be around the economy how 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 are we looking at um, uh, the uh, economic side of it it is a well known fact that our we have limited means uh, for uh, for for in the economic side because it competes with with your bread and butter as we say of, of the healthcare uh, infrastructure uh, uh, education uh, these these are competing with us in, in as far as the uh, modernization military modernization is con concerned but in spite of that over the last two years uh, we have had a 10% year on over year increase in the capital uh, budget uh, for modernization and in the last this year in fact we have got a 18.71 increase in the uh, percent increase in the cap capex uh, for for military modernization so if i look at the last 3 years this is 10 plus 10 plus 19 which is almost working out to about 40% or 39% increase in capex yes some people would say that men much of this is stuck in 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 uh, committed liabilities but then committed liabilities is a work in progress what happens today obviously does not get bought tomorrow it gets bought day after or day day after so everything has a has a cycle it takes a little while and this particular pipeline will remain but uh, of course there are some issues about this uh, order pipeline which i can come back later to but yes this uh, thing about this 40% increase in the capex is is something to reckon with out of this yes some of it was was pushed by the emergency purchases of last year which were ordered last year amounting to almost about 3 billion dollars 3 billion dollars is uh, is a lot of money which has got incorporated as part of this 40 40 person that i'm talking about uh, if i look at the indian industry per se there is a separate budget kept aside by the government in terms of in 2020 2021 it was 52000 crores in this year it has increased to 70000 crores which is kept aside for indian industry alone so which means that when we talk of imports of 12% which you mentioned a little while back we will no more be in that category very soon very good if if so so with this uh, i i think i'll i'll wind up very, and uh, we can talk of some there are some cons there are some issues yeah. which we can discuss later very good very good excellent i feel uh, i quite uh, if i was to make a general statement i would say that no other government has brought so much change in this landscape and no other government uh, has been able to stress exports uh, in in the way this government has and uh, we we know that the uh, the defense procurement policy which is now the dap uh, has gone through 47 uh, revisions which means that the government is listening uh, we also it also means that perhaps it can be a little more thorough however 
uh, what you have said uh, on the innovation piece that innovation comes from the military, uh, from the army, uh, the IDEX and the IDEX FOGI is a, a great uh, thing. I remember Machiavelli said that do not depend on mercenaries in a war. They are not yours, have your own soldiers. And now in today's day, it is very important that we have our own technology because soldier alone is not enough to, uh, to win the war. You have to have your own technology. The SME point which you brought in, now there are 8,000 SMEs in the defense sector. And this number is likely to go to 16,000. And as you know, most of the big suppliers are system integrators all over the world in this sector. And the core technologies are held by SMEs only. Then the defense corridors also have come up. Two defense corridors around PSUs, around organized institutes like in, uh, uh, IIT Kanpur, etc. And the right synergies should be brought in. You have also spoken about uh, the DPSUs, corporate, corporatization of DPSUs. They have to now pay tax. So the uh, so the, the field is being leveled and right now, so far, I feel that DPSUs still have a long way to go, but they have started moving forward. And this 23rd position, I did not know that we are now the 23rd largest exporter of arms. Uh, traditionally, there was USA, Europe, Russia and Israel. Now the new defense manufacturers are China. North Korea, Turkey, and India. That's great. Fantastic. So that's the very good side of the ledger. I would like Ms. Uh, Major General uh, Rohit Gupta now to come in on two points. One is I would like you to extend the beautiful discussion you, uh, you started and uh, come to the arrangements the, the, the agreements between India and US, then close that piece and then come to how you would uh, respond to what uh, Brigadier Bhattacharya and I have said uh, in support of the government uh, and, and, and come in with your points as to how we can do better on the indigenization and export piece, given your wide years of experience, Major General Gupta. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Power. Um, um, I'll take off with what uh, uh, I had concluded that, uh, look, if we have to have a collaborative arrangement in Indo-Pacific, there has to be a plug and play. Plug and play requires commonality of equipment. Which is the country that can provide the technology? It is US primarily. Of course, there are other countries like South Korea, Israel, uh, they definitely do have technology, but here we are talking about the primarily the Indo-Pacific. As far as Australia is concerned, South Korea is concerned, Japan is concerned, they already have sufficient linkages with the US in terms of the various PACs, agreements. As a result of them, they are tier one close allies. And that is significant, which I will come to. If we have to get the technology, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Pramit uh, spoke about our brave soldiers. Um, uh, I think in the world today, our soldiers are considered as the, uh, as the soldiers that any army would require in their establishment. Uh, they're so good. The problem is that we do not have technological enablement to the degree that is required to enable them to be formidable in terms of offense and defense. And that is where China in its capability is beating us. And modern warfare is changing in its transition from manpower intensive operations to firepower, pinpoint accuracy of firepower. And that is the problem that is there with the Indian Army to some extent. I don't say that we don't have full capability, but definitely we could do with better capability. When integrated with the fact that we need to do a plug and play in Indo-Pacific to be found an effective counter, uh, we come to the fact that we have to be able to tie up with the US in terms of the technology agreements. Now, what is the issue? The issue is 
There is a U.S. Department of Commerce Strategic Trade Authorization License Exemption, STA Tier 1. Now, what does it mean is that without this, the country has to go through the Senate to get various exceptions to niche technology which are there in the restrictive regime. STA 1 allows India to come into the Tier 1 to receive sensitive technology and military items without the US exporter having to go through the commerce department for a license. Now that becomes far more easier. Earlier in 2002, one will ask me as to, well, look, this thing has been happening. What's the issue all about? 2002, we had the General Security of Military Information Agreement, JASOMIA, which enabled sharing of classified data between government entities only. It did not include private sector. Now what has happened in 2019, the Indian Security Annex, the Industrial Security Annex has been signed, which is to the JASOMIA which allows the US companies to share sensitive technology information with the Indian private companies. And India now has been moved to tier one. That means we are favorite country in terms of the allies and exchange of equipment and technology. How is it important that three pacts have been signed to enable this? The first pact, pact is LIOMA. Uh, LIOMA is nothing but Logistic Exchange Memorandum of Agreement 2016, way back. But it looks basically at the issues of logistics, supplies, and services. The implementation is important, but in terms of resource deployment, repair facilities, and oil, it was the preliminary that was signed. Important, but not the crux of the entire issue. Second one is the COMCOSA, which is important. This has been signed. Uh, recently in 2018, which is Communication, Compatibility and Security Agreement. Now, without this COMCASA, we could not have a transfer of sensitive communication, security and equipment and codes from US to India. It implied that we could not be able to use data from America to enable our systems. Neither could we talk to them on a direct interoperability link. Now it facilitates interoperability between their forces and us, as well as the rest of the Quad countries in this area, which use US origin uh, systems for a secure data link. Now this is extremely important. Um, uh, the, it also ensures that we have access to an internet intelligence network system, like network intelligence coming from satellites directly and not an indirect, which takes time. So real-time information is available to react on. The last one, which has been recently signed in October 2020, is possibly the most important, which is the BECA, Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement, without which nothing could have moved. It is a pact looking at intelligence information for use by the governments for defense and other purposes. So he exchanges data with us for technical procedural information, standardization of methods, specification formats for the collection, processing and production of geo-intelligence information within India. Therefore, now there is a complete plug and play that is required, including the fact that we can now use US missiles in collaborative arrangement should it be required, in the country because we have got GPS, US GPS accurate data available for their accuracy. We don't need a missile as only as a munition delivery, but precision emanation. So not only that we can come to a collaborative arrangement, we can also use their missiles if required through other collaborative arrangements. And that was very, very important. However, there is an issue to this that the complete technology behind all this will take some years to be able to fruitify. And uh, uh, this has to be worked upon in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, the various kinds of measures and the ability to absorb the technology. However, it means, say, for example, I'm not saying F, uh, F-35 should be purchased by India, but yes, it op opens the pavement for F-35 to be purchased by India. Otherwise, without these agreements, you cannot go through the issue of F-35 because it is a highly classified stealth uh, aircraft in the fifth generation. 
So I will come to the issue of one thing what was mentioned by Mr. Pramod. What has opened up for us with all this and which is extremely important to us. Besides the weapon systems, I will not go into it. Neither Mr. Pramod go that much into weapon systems. Artificial intelligence, 5G networking, quantum computing, encryption, iterative manufacturing. You have to have rare metals, valuable metals, which are not available at the time this pact was signed. Unarmed systems and robotics, hypersonic flight. We talked about hypersonic missiles, unable to intercept and also for space applications. Electromagnetic weapons, directed energy weapons, internet of things, augmented and virtual reality. Uh, Mr. Pramit mentioned cyber, cyber uh, issues to which we have not been able to have that much of things. Why this? Chip manufacture. We don't have any chip manufacture facility available with us. Whatever is available for us is rudimentary. It cannot take care of advanced systems. We need that to happen. So you have advanced maneuverable long range missiles. I said that we need technological enablement. Missile defense in interceptors. We're getting the S-400, other missile defense interceptors also there. Hypervelocity projectiles, yeah. drone swarms. It opens it up, loitering munitions. Quantum encryption, extremely important in today's world if we have to have cyber capability, directed energy weapons, not only for, uh, for land, also for space. Electronic attack capability, both defense and attack capability, advanced capability, and advanced anti-submarine warfare capabilities. DRDO has recently, in October 2020, tried out the supersonic missile-assisted release of torpedoes. Uh, it is, it is uh, a niche technology which has been able to uh, demonstrate. And uh, that is something which is very good with technological enablement. I would mention one issue amongst all this, which is space. And I want to stress upon this. Um, space is an area which is emerging. China is way behind, way, way ahead of the other countries, including US in the issues of space. Identified space as the focal agency way back in 1900s. And today it has gone to a level where it can establish a complete constellation of space aircraft. It has established ASAT capability in geo, not in low earth orbit, in geo. It has ability to have laser as well as, uh, uh, well as electromagnetic destruction of, uh, of uh, satellites. It's way beyond. Now, what is the importance that is coming in in space? Actually, space is going to be a big market. Satellite manufacture 2026 is supposed to be 10,000 more small satellites to be deployed in low Earth orbit only. Launchers, you have to have launchers to be able to do this. Mr. Sivam is in record of saying that private industry, now with the opening up of ISRO, can build their own launch pads in Sri Harikota. Satellite based applications, extremely important, remote sensing and communication. Yeah. Servicing satellites, they will be used for servicing of the satellites in space. It is supposed to be a US uh, 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 4.5 billion market by 2028. Earth observation, it is 4.8 billion by 2222. Communication, satcoms, US 130 billion, that is going to be there. All this shall be enabled with various, these pacts that we had with US. It opens up the entire issue. Coming to weaponization, we have the issues of the Defense Space Agency and the uh, uh, Defense Space Research Agency, which has come up. Now, these are looking at something like space situational awareness. Now, space situational awareness is only possible if you got a vast network of telescope, long range radars and space radars, plus interplay of getting the information directly. So your Comcasa as well as Becca is going to enable that. Second comment, Elent, Imagent, all enabled by both the agreements. Launch on demand. Uh, we take months to launch a satellite. You want readily available launchers, redeployable so that they can't be destroyed to launch satellites because these launch satellites could also be killer satellites. Electronic warfare, directed energy weapons, greater sophistication yeah. of anti-satellites, be able to neutralize enemy satellites in space. So actually this entire thing has been opened up by the means of uh, these agreements that are there. Coming to the last part, uh, which uh, you uh, asked me to amplify in terms of the enablement that has taken place. 
I will take five minutes over that only. I would say the DAP has been drafted by extensive interaction over two years across all stakeholders. That means it is inclusive. And therefore, the DAP has made radical changes in the way we approach and process procurement cases. It is a, it's an admirable uh, issue that they have been achieved. And I think the document is holistic, inclusive, and well-oriented for the intent of the country that is Atmandar Bharata. It couldn't be a better document. However, I have said, said this, they always scope for reaching higher, improving, looking at things, tweaking things. So I would stress on one issue, related issue and progress to others, R&D. R&D, research and development, is the, is the backbone for indigenization of all processes. The government has given a 300 uh, 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 crore jump to the R&D budget for DRDO. Unfortunately, last year it could not expend it because of various reasons. It will expend it this year with a 300 jump more onto it. And that is very vital. This jump is very vital. However, DRDO needs to, look, needs to look at something which is development, come production, partnership, which is part of the DAP, which it is following. What is required is the in private industry should be brought right at the research and development stage so that the imbibing of the technology, progressing it to development and then to production takes place in a smooth manner. With the industry coming in between, it becomes very difficult to be able to involve the technology. So that is where the uh, development come production partnership has to be uh, further tweaked in a fashion it can go through. Uh, DRDO is looking at it. I'm well aware of the factor. The uh, second issue is the issue of the private industry. All private industry is looking at R&D. They're doing it in their own capacity. Are we doing R&D in the same product with too many companies? Everybody pumping in money. And please understand that R&D looks at almost 40% of a production of a complete thing that's a financial outlay over 10 years that he can recoup. So it's a waste of money. So we need to have some sort of an orientation toward, of companies towards which products they need to do R&D which, which have a surety of production at a later stage. We can't do it over the plethora of all the equipment, not possible. So what do we do is we have for it a strategic partnership model. Now the strategic partnership model has been used in the ship building industry extremely effective. And I think it's a very, a very unique and a very um, uh, challenging um, uh, thing that has been implemented by the government with LNT on board. I think this has to be now be spread. It has been spread to all apex procurement like artillery, AD, tanks, ICVs, helicopters, aircraft, etc. This will allow these in these apex products, not in everything, but in apex product, concentrated research and development to be taken blade with a surety of procurement. And that is the you know, and what is there is that the technology from abroad will be facilitated by the government. It is part of the DAP enshrined. It needs to be expanded far more than what it is. What is important is. Like uh, uh, Mr. Pavan said, the company is an integrator primarily and possibly producing some components and some assemblies of which it has the thing. Rest of it is from the tier one and tier two. So it allows the entire ecology system to build up and the defense industry comes up. The ecology system also has got now the provision of concentrating onto its R&D. Next factor I'll come to it. Our honorable uh, prime minister has most aptly put it the government has no business to be in business. Hats off to him for the statement. I think it's a tremendous statement. The privatization of the DPSU is a brilliant move by the government. It not only brings in the money to the Consolidated Fund of India, which, which they require, but what does it do is bring the strategic partnership model to the doorstep of the private industry. How is that happening? DPSUs are the principal areas along with OFBs producing big FX products. If you're going to have a private industry having a majority holding of 51%, uh, 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 capitalist system, uh, 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 economy driven system of management, the socialist basis of uh, solidity of production of the DPSU itself, with the government on a 26% on the management board for monitoring, assisting and enabling, including foreign technology. 
the foreign technology import also they will be happy to do it to a government uh, minority holding in which the monitoring is there so that nothing goes wrong in their ipr rights and it does not go to a foreign power who which they are not happy with and this is the concern which us has at numerous times and i would like this to be spread not only to the dpsus and to the big dpsus like bell and hhl also the issue of corporatization of the ordnance factory which shall thereafter go to privatization also the army base workshop like 505 and 515 were yeah. involved in overhaul and a component level affair so this becomes extremely important for the enablement of the complete uh, structure that is there for the purpose of indigenization i finished mr no, no thank you very much i think it was a very comprehensive summary we are Uh, 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 we thank the audience for being with us uh, about thirty minutes more than uh, what we had uh, planned, and uh, uh, that is uh, that speaks about the speakers. I will just come to uh, for last comments to Brigadier Ashish, and thereafter I will go to uh, Mr. Pramit uh, to give his concluding remarks. Brigadier, what would you like to add to what has been discussed so far? <coughs> Uh, from uh, from SIDM side. So so uh, you see, uh, I must compliment uh, General Rohit for this for this uh, things that I had left out as you know uh, because of the time of this thing. But he's he's covered it very well, and uh, you know two major things or three major things as a closing remark I can I can put it. Uh, if you remember this project called IGMDP. Yes, which produced the best uh, missiles, world-class right. missiles today, which the world fears, yep. and it has given you you world-class capability. This is something which I think is missing from our this particular method or, or approach to forming of strategic projects is something which is missing in our inventory, and and this is where I think we can look at you know the. You, uh, like very correctly, uh, uh, Major General uh, Rohit brought out that the DAP is a fantastic document, but implementation depends on people in whose hand you give the book. Now, how he reads the paragraph depends on his and and his attitude will depend on that. He, I find a major attitudinal change uh, over the last about five seven years. things are going to work out but along with that we require a dedicated strategic project uh, management group and could be uh, this would work best in case it was something like an autonomous body monitoring its progress till the end and that is the way to move this forward and and for things like what he brought out like we must have our tanks aircrafts and 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 uh, helicopters everything coming through this way i think this is the approach we must take and we have got a very good example in this the nuclear submarine a very very successful program is very close to what i am talking about is very close to this method of uh, uh, addressing this one number two we have the industry has no way to know what is in the pipeline for the next 15 years in terms of products it has something called a tpcr which is the technology uh, road map which tells you in a very very broad term what is the technology you are looking at but there is no guarantee in that document that even after you have put in if 20 people have put in money into research of that who's going to get a job or or a uh, or a order in that uh, so a very very concretized product pipeline road map has to be put in place for the industry to look ahead and put in money in the research and development as uh, was being brought out because r and d as uh, again very correctly brought out is the heart of atmanirbhar bharat and that is where you require a very very concrete project pipeline document which tells us ki in these many years i require this particular item and i give assurance that if you give and of course it has to be coordinated the whole effort of r&d has to be coordinated by an agency maybe it could go to the drdo it could go to the ddp anyone for that matter but it has to be done and uh, and and also there is the other thing is uh, 
you know some very good things have happened like the industry is taken into account nowadays are is taken into confidence when they uh, when they uh, uh, put a qualitative requirement is in place today in a pre bid or in even in an rfi stage i have at least myself in sidm have brought the industry together to the armed forces sat with them for three four sittings working out what a let's say a six wheeled armored personal carrier should have or what is the indian industry that can give this in that sort of a thing is is very very uh, it is doing uh, the rounds and and many people are uh, aligning to this particular uh, way of uh, of of uh, doing business with the with the defense forces uh, but but this requires a little more tweaking and a little more push uh, so that uh, you know the involvement of the industry and and its uh, money that it puts in is restricted to because at the end of the day it is the money of the country which cannot be lost so if there are 20 people given the job of developing a, a auxiliary power unit and one of them will get the job 19 of them have lost all the money that they have put in so this sort of a management system has to be put in place which will not do colossal amount of waste in this field uh i think there are many many things we can yeah. continue talking till the cows come home but there is uh, i i think i, I can only I think touch. very very well put very well put you have said that product pipeline visibility is very important for the industry that in the interest of being inclusive you should not spread your resources so thin as happened in the hardware electronic sector where we could not create a single giant because we wanted to be so inclusive and we we spread our resources thin we need to concentrate on some of the front runners and have that moral high ground that when we concentrate on those front runners we are not seen as partial and third thing which you brought out as well as major roy uh, general roy brought out that was the speed of projects the speed of projects should be monitored Uh, they uh, they should not take an eternal you know time span uh, you uh, we are making one warship in 18 years china how come it makes 18 warships in one year we have to think about all these things those are areas where we should uh, shine our light and of course at the same time uh, applaud the government on some unprecedented breakthroughs in this sector uh, pramit let me come to you and ask you what are your final comments so i'll just go back to the geopolitics so when we're looking we need partners we've all agreed on that we need partners for technology we need partners for investment we need partners for strategic reasons um what do we look for in those partnerships on the defense side it's important to realize that when you tie up your fighter aircraft your frontline fighter aircraft with one country you're you're effectively tying a huge chunk of your national security to that country for the next 20 30 40 years it's not just a short term contract you know just make somebody make some money uh, and you get a piece of equipment you're literally you ex- you have to trust that partner to be stable for the next 2 3 4 decades uh because you will still need their spare parts you will still need inputs from them uh to be able to maintain that so your first requirement for a strategic partner globally is the question of trust trust is not the way that human two individuals may trust each other but that the fact that the convergence of strategic interest between the two countries is seen as enough to maintain a relationship for a large long number of years um second you want quality you want products from those countries you want those those partners um to show um a the technological capacity and for us right now that really means uh do you have the capacity especially for our frontline weapon system to defeat china if you sell us a fighter aircraft or a ship that is clearly inferior to what we will be facing with china and remind and keep in mind that whatever china makes some version of that will eventually go to pakistan um then we have a problem and it's one of the problems that russia i think now faces with us and finally generosity if you wish uh, in other words 
as we mentioned, we need to build, you have to believe that India's, the rise of India is fundamentally strategically important to you. And this incorporates your willingness to give us technology, investments, um, support that sometimes are going to have to be on a non-commercial basis um, with a long-term point of view as to, uh, as to uh, its, its uh, strategic utility to you as a, as a country. And that's what we're basically looking for. The good thing that we have right now is that we have a lot of choices. So you look at our fighter aircraft. We can now choose between, we have the British and the Japanese coming to us, consider investing in our fifth generation temp, uh, Tempest fighter. The French saying, let's go for a fifth generation Rafale. We have the Swedish coming to consider fifth generation Gripen. You have the Americans offering us two or three different types of aircraft. Um, and you have the Russians as well. So you have that choice, which we've never had before. And that's basically what, <clears throat> then we have to be looking at these other factors to make the decision of what choices to make. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Pramit. I think you have summarized it beautifully that we need loyal supplies, a loyal partner. But if we were to put all our eggs in one basket and tomorrow that partner uh, doesn't come up to our expectations, then what do we do? So we have to hedge our bets. Uh, we have to do keystone diplomacy where we can project ourselves as the keystone, that particular stone in the building, which if you shake, the whole building crumbles. And uh, as the keystone in the defense architecture or security architecture, um, Machiavelli has said a beautiful point on this. It is, he has said that republics are more trustworthy than autocracies. And he has given a very good uh, reason for that. Um, having said that, it is the, uh, the world order, the rules of the world, as well as the contracts which we draw, which will ensure that we go for those partnerships uh, with those countries who will really uh, honor every word, uh, and honor the letter and spirit of the, their agreements. And meanwhile, continue to make sure uh, that our industry so develops that we are not so dependent on imports, which is what uh, Ashish said. So great, it was a very fine discussion. Thank you very much everybody and thank you audience. Uh, even after uh, being about 45, 50 minutes over and above our tentative timeline, uh, so many of you have stayed back, which speaks uh, for the quality of the dialogue as well as the insightfulness and appreciation of the, uh, of the audience. The, what, what an informed audience. Thank you very much. Siddharth, I pass it on to you. Thank you very much, uh, sirs. Uh, such a deep and insightful discussion. Our leaders and I took home several nuggets from today's conversation. And, and, and how well moderated, Mr. Chaudhary. Thank you very much. And thank you to our leaders in the audience for joining us and staying till the end. Uh, along with our weekly webinars, we will soon be taking these discussions on the exclusive mobile app, which is curated for senior leaders. Uh, we are sending out invitations to select leaders across our six sectors, which are aerospace and defense, real estate, healthcare, energy, e-mobility, and logistics. So whether you would like to engage with us on our platform, learners, you're invited to connect with us for membership to join the aerospace and defense circle and also get access to the other allied industry circles as well. So thank you very much, sirs. It's been an absolute privilege and look forward to such conversations in the future. Thank you. Thank you.